Hello everyone, welcome back to another Bible study and episode review in Shady Oak Ministries. I'm of course Shady Oak, and today we're going to be discussing episode 20 of season 8 of the TV show My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, the episode The Washouts. The topic of jealousy is an interesting one because we rarely see a situation where it's a good thing. But I'd like to talk to you all today about an illustration we saw in today's episode of where actually jealousy is, in fact, a virtue and not a vice. And with that in mind as well, to point out a very controversial topic among Christian circles, not necessarily in the Christian circles, but leveled against them, saying, your God is a jealous God, and jealousy is never a good thing. Well, I'd like to argue to the contrary, not only using today's episode as the illustration, but with that groundwork tying those illustrations, that common ground, back into Scripture to show what we mean when we say, and when Scripture itself says, that God is a jealous God. Let's start with Exodus 34, verse 14, where after Israel did something that nearly saw themselves destroy each other. This, this action that's not really appropriate to mention among public audiences, they almost ended up annihilating themselves as a nation, doing something they knew was wrong, but did it anyway. And this covenant, this promise that they made with their relationship with God had to be renewed. And this was actually a reference back, uh, repeating a reiteration of one of the Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 5. Exodus 34 verse 14 says the same, where it says, You shall worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. Now, let's ask ourselves this. Is jealousy always a wrong choice to make? Is it a wrong attitude to have? Well, understand, jealousy is an emotion. And like all emotions, there's a right and a wrong way to use it. Several examples of the wrong ways to practice it were illustrated today in the washouts. They were all examples of jealousy, ponified, if you will. Rolling Thunder had definitely a presence of fear amongst herself, but it wasn't in the sense of how it should be used, but rather she considered it a weakness instead of a warning of physical harm and danger. Secondly, short views was a good illustration of anger that is also an aspect of jealousy. A response, an emotional reaction to blocked goals, but instead of seeing it as a warning in that regard, he considered it a motivator. And it didn't make him very easy to be around, mind you, as well. Then, of course, lightning dust. She's back, and she was a perfect illustration of how jealousy wasn't meant to be used. She saw it as security in her relationships as opposed to a warning of what we'll be discussing here today. When we call each other jealous, we're usually associating any of the three factors that made the washouts who they were. And jealousy, understand this, is based on a fear of losing a relationship, a response of anger of having that relationship violated, and desiring security in a relationship. None of these are bad in of themselves, but they are so easily abused when catch this. They are based on self-interest. So let's tie this back to the initial verse. When the Bible says that God is a jealous God, is this a jealousy based on self-interest or not? Well, let's start with the first fact in God's jealousy. Understand that God's jealousy first begins with that fear factor, if you will, to reference the old TV show. He doesn't want us to settle for less than what is best for us. He fears that. A good example of this would be the law of the Old Testament, and compare that illustration as well to Spitfire. She didn't spend all that time yelling in Scootaloo's face, saying, you'll end up in a full body cast drinking and eating through a straw because it gave her some sort of enjoyment out of scaring little foals. The reason she was putting such emotion into these things was because she'd seen it happen before and didn't want to see it happen again. Now catch this. The point is also made about the Old Testament law. The reason we were given not just the Ten Commandments, but the other 613 laws in the ancient Israeli government system was not just to see God's character put on display, that he has standards, we haven't kept them, but to prepare us for the solution to that problem. Here's your problem. You haven't kept God's standards. What do I do about it? He's 
coming. Ex er, excuse me, Galatians chapter 3, verse 22. But scripture has confined all under sin. Great, but what then? That the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Those who recognize they need saving, they'll look to a savior. Those who don't think they need saving, what good did Jesus do them? And that was the point. Before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law. And as I recall, guards usually protect you from what? Being harmed. Kept for the faith, which would afterward be revealed. So understand this first point in emphasis. God's fear, the fear aspect of his jealousy for you, is he doesn't want you to settle for less than his best. And that's what ties us into the second aspect, the anger aspect of jealousy. Now remember, anger isn't a wrong emotion. It can be used in wrong ways. But the real fundamental core of what anger is, is recognizing a goal has been blocked. And this is where God's anger in his aspect of jealousy comes into play. He allows the existence of an alternative and won't force you to love him back. A good example of this would be the existence of Satan and the illustration we had of him in lightning dust. Notice in this passage that I'm about to read to you that Jesus doesn't eliminate competition between us and him. He simply sets himself aside, or alongside rather, the true intentions of everything else and lets you make up your mind. John chapter 10 and verse 10, the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and may have it more abundantly. Make your choice. One may appeal to you with thrills and the forbidden, but where is he ultimately taking you? The pony cost and the straw? No, worse. Separate from everything good. On the other hand, what does Jesus offer you? Not just preservation of life, but a life worth living in the meantime. And laying himself out before you, he is angered by the blocked goal of this other being in existence that is in competition between you and him with him. But understand this as well. He doesn't negate that choice. He leaves that in your hands. And third, he wants us to love him because he loved us first. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10, in this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the ransom for our sins. A good example of this would be not just Jesus and of himself, but Rainbow Dash's fan club for Scootaloo. God doesn't demand we focus on him. He spends all his time focusing on us first. Psalm 139, verses 1 through 6. Old Testament, by the way. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways. Before there is a word on my tongue, but behold, Lord, you know it all together. You have hedged me behind and before. You've laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. The psalm goes on to say, Your thoughts towards me number greater than the sands of the seashore. If we were to mathematically calculate that, if we were to measure up all the quantillions of grains of sand that we have here on this planet and compare that, to the, say, number of seconds that have existed according to the biblical framework of the beginning of the universe, that would leave God room for you, assuming, you know, we have around 100 billion people in all of human history. That would leave him room for you to think about you six times every second. Now that's more investment than posters and a slogan, don't you think? He's eavesdropping on those things. Not just that, but he's hosting them about you. Now understand this. Do you see a trend of self-interest here as far as God's pattern of jealousy? Was God focused on who was God focused on rather when he gave us the law? His reputation or our safety? His fear was toward us being hurt. 
Who was God focused on when he allowed Satan to exist? His reputation or our ability to choose? He wants you to make a choice and an informed choice as to where that will ultimately lead. How does that tie into anger? He's not blocking your goal in letting you make up your mind. Even if it ends up blocking his goal to have a relationship with you, he would rather allow you to make the wrong choice than to prevent you from making the right one. Who was God focused on when he came to this world to die for us? He can't offer us something better than himself because there isn't anything better than him for him to offer us. He's the only being that can be jealous and do it perfectly. Not because of his insecurity, but understand what jealousy comes from. His desire for exclusivity with you. And if you understand these three premises in the right way, well, then God being a jealous God is actually an encouraging thing, don't you think? Thank you for your time and listening to this study. If you have any sincere questions, ask them. If you'd like to encourage the ministry, do so. But most importantly, if you know someone who would benefit from hearing this study, please share it with them, whether it's in person yourself or through sharing this study. Let me do the work for you. I encourage either way. Thank you for your time and listening to this study. Remember that Jesus loves you and what he means when he says that he's jealous for you. He desires an exclusive relationship with you. And what else would you describe love as anyway, if not that desire, that passionate pursuit of you and him alone?